Hey, it's time for voiceover body shop tech talk number 34. Woo! How do you like that? 34. We got lots to talk about tonight. Uh, you've got some cool stuff in your tech update, like. Oh, I'm going to talk about what peering means. Okay. In relation to Source Connect and anytime things don't seem to work well on your computer, on the internet, but everything seems fine. Talk about that. And also I mentioned my new, one of my new favorite gadgets, the Luna display adapter. I've what the heck it is and what do you do with it? Heard a lot about that. Yeah. We're also going to talk about what's that hissing sound that you hear. Eh, no, it sounds like a far off waterfall. And we got lots of great questions that you guys have been sending in. So stay tuned. It's now time for voiceover body shop tech talk. From the outer reaches, they came. Bearing the knowledge of what it takes to properly record your voiceover audio. And together, from the center of the VO universe, they bring it to you now. George Widom, the engineer to the VO stars, a Virginia Tech grad with the skills to build, set up, and maintain the professional VO studios of the biggest names in VO today. And you, Dan Leonard, the voiceover home studio master. A professional voice talent with the knowledge and experience to help you create a professional sounding home VO studio. And each week, they allow you into their world, making the complex simple, debunking the myths of what it takes to create great sounding audio, answering your questions, showing you the latest and greatest in VO tech, and having a dandy time doing it. Welcome to VoiceOver Body Shop Tech Talk. VoiceOver Body Shop Tech Talk is brought to you by VoiceOverEssentials.com, home of Harlan Hogan Signature Products, Source Elements, remote studio connections for everyone, VoiceActorWebsites.com, where your VO website isn't a pain in the butt, VOHeroes.com, become a hero to your clients with award-winning voiceover training, J. Michael Collins Demos, when quality matters, and VoiceOver Extra, your daily resource for VO success. And now, live to drive from their super secret clubhouse and studio in Sherman Oaks, California. Here are the guys. Well, good evening or afternoon or whatever time you're watching this. I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver. Body shop or V O B S S talk 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 tech talk talk talk. Anyway, well, here we are. It's tech talk number thirty four. We have been isolated from each other for an awful long time, and that has brought on all sorts of interesting things. Uh, we are you as busy as I am? As a matter of fact. I don't think anybody could possibly be as busy as you. When I came to visit you, it's like, and I'm I'm, I'm off for an hour for lunch, and that's it. And then yeah, I have to it, make myself take lunch. And even when I book out an hour for lunch, I usually only have a half hour because I go too long on the last call, and then I have all these emails that came in in the last hour during the last call that I'm answering. Before I know it, I get 15, 20 minutes tops for lunch. So I learned I can make a tuna sandwich, toasted bread. <laughs> From scratch and eat it in 20 minutes yeah that's we're, the kids we're busy uh because everybody <laughs> has to have a home studio these days yeah they're all they're calling us because we're the guys who know there's a lot of people out there that say yeah i can tell you a lot about how to do this and there's other things george and i have been doing this a long time which is why we come to you every week saying you know we've been doing this a long time and uh we know what it takes to create a home voiceover studio. It's not as sophisticated and complicated as a lot of people make it out to be. It's not having racks and equipment and a 32 track board and guitars on the wall and windows and all that stuff that people see when they walk into a studio and say, well, that must be how you make voiceover. And it's really got very little to do with it. And we understand that most importantly though, and George and I totally agree on this. We usually agree on almost everything, but it's all about acoustics. It's all about where you record. You can ha you don't want to have a cheap microphone, but you want to have a good microphone. And 
But if you have a good microphone, the better microphone you have, the better the environment in which you are recording in better be. It and, should be proportionally good. Yeah, that's that's a good way to put it. Uh, but we're seeing all these specs coming down from you know from from agencies saying, well, you should have a TLM one hundred and three and a U eight or a U eighty seven and this and that. Never a discussion of the environment in which you record. But I would think, George, that that's really what you and I do the most is we walk into people's homes when we can, uh, and say, where's the best place to record? Where's the quietest place? What's going to be the easiest? to acoustically adjust. And uh, that's that's an important thing. And uh, we want you guys to know if you really want professional help with this, to really understand it and learn it from the bottom up so it's not a something that's going to bother you, you should work with one of us because we're good at it. If they want to work with you, George, what do they do and where do they go and how do they get a hold of you? You got to head over to georgethe.tech. That's my website, and all the services are over there. You can uh, book services by the half hour, or we can work uh, virtually where you send me your audio and I send back the results of whatever we're doing, be it a sound check or a customized stack or what have you. I also do a lot of Universal Audio Apollo setups, and I have a service based around that specific thing. So, if you have any of those kinds of questions, you can find me at georgethe.tech. But Dan does a lot of the same stuff As a on his home on the net, which is... HomeVoiceOverStudio.com uh, and see all the things that I do. Very similar stuff to George. Uh, I'm also a voice actor, so I really know where you're coming from and what's involved in creating a, a studio that fits your lifestyle. And that's really important because it's a home studio. And... Uh, I like to come in and, you know, we do it by Zoom right now, which is working just fine, uh, looking at different places in people's homes or apartments and finding what's going to be the best place acoustically for you to record, because the equipment is not the big difference. You know, like I said, you don't want lousy equipment. You don't want cheap, low consumer stuff. You want stuff that's going to be professional grade, but unless you have the space to record in, it really doesn't really matter. You know, although, you know, this morning I was having a discussion with a, with a, a, a personal friend of ours today, and he, we were talking about this thing that you got to have a TLM 103. And we're like, well, I got a TLM 1. You know, if they ask, you know, if they, if an agent asks, do you have a TLM? Yeah, I got a TLM 103. You know, and they'll, and they'll, you'll do a session and they'll present to, yeah, it was. You know, you may not have used it. And it's like, well, yeah, I got one. It's just sitting in a box in the closet, though. Uh, so. <laughs> I, I don't understand why they keep throwing out all this these these high end specs and don't discuss the fact that you need an acoustically neutral and sterile environment in which to use these high end equipment. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, need and you need a preamp. I see that one too. Yeah. You need a preamp. And you need to have these are myths, by the way. And you need to have a a professional DAW. Right. Twisted wave won't cut it. Yeah, that's another one. I'm just, yeah, it's like you got to have one of these big things. It's like now this box is still sitting here from last week when we were doing the interface thing. It's, they're just I'll violent. collect that one of these things. <laughs> well, we got to have lunch and I'll bring it back to you. Yeah. But anyway, but we've been busy little beavers in the last couple of weeks, and uh, we really appreciate your business. And uh, but we try to give you as much information as we can to make it a little bit easier for you and support you and, and that sort of thing. So what's in your tech update this week? Tech update. Okay, well, um, one of the biggies that just came up today, because it personally interrupted my getting work done with a client, is dealing with internet connection issues when you've already done everything right. So you're doing Source Connect, you're doing all the things that we've told you to do for setting up Source Connect from not using Wi-Fi, having a, a hard line connection, you know, Ethernet connection from your computer to your router, either via just a long cable or using some power line Ethernet adapters. You have port mapped your ports. You've done all those things to ensure good connectivity. You've even checked to see how fast is your internet connection today. Well, 
yes, we we actually did all these things today during the session. I was getting on fiber 300 megabits up and down. My uh, client was on a uh, spectrum getting 350 down, 20 megabits up, which is very typical for cable. Everything seemed copacetic, yet during our connection, very often mid sentence or randomly, his connection on Source Connect would just poof, disappear. It would cut out, drop out left and right. Now at the same time, we're on Zoom. And so whenever that would happen, I would just reconnect on Zoom or I would just turn on our mics in Zoom. Audio was there, everything was working. I could see his screen. We were remote desktops. We knew everything was working on the internet. We knew his connection was solid. And yet, Source Connect was having dropouts. So who's the first person I blamed? Of course, it was Source Connect. So I texted my friend Robert at Source Elements. It's kind of nice to know people in high places when you're getting support, right? And he wanted to immediately call me and dispel the myth that the problem was Source Connect. So here's what the issue was, and it's something called peering. So when you're using Source Connect standard, your computer and the computer of the studio on the other end or the other user are making about as direct of a connection between each other as possible. Of course, you're going through the internet, so it's going through multiple switches and sw uh, data networks and things on the internet as it travels between the two of you. But essentially, it's a direct connection. It's peer to peer. Um, whereas if you were using something like that works on Chrome, for example, like Source Connect now, that's going through a centralized server. So there's a lot more uh, that can go wrong there. So Source Connect, you're actually peer to peer. However, your ISP, the company providing you your source, con your um, internet connection, they have something to do with this as well. So they have what's called peering agreements with companies that make software, uh, that stream services such as Netflix and things like that. And so sometimes these peering agreements mean they're going to deprecate other person, other software and other systems connectivity. So they're basically giving because of deals they've made with Netflix and Sony and Disney and Apple, they're giving them as much bandwidth as possible through their peering agreements. And then other services like Source Connect, who trust me, don't have sway like those companies do, get the shaft. And so their connections can suffer. So that is something that can happen when using Source Connect. And so fortunately, there is a system that I found out that I've known about for a while, but haven't had to use it really, called Source Stream. And so when that's enabled by both users, now that connection is going through different pipes through the internet. And in doing so, that can work around these problems. And so that was a real revelation to me. I mean, Dan, I've been doing this a long time. You know that we've tried all sorts of systems. We've tested everything. And still these surprises peep, uh, crop up. So, so, you know, when things go wrong and it's very easy to assume it's gotta be the software or the service that you're using on your computer or their computer, that's directly at fault. But there's a lot more going on behind the scenes from between you the backbone of the internet and the rest of the signal chain that can get in the way. We don't have any idea what's going on between here and there. It's just, it blows. No. You talk to internet engineers and you're like, huh? <laughs> it's like, yeah. And, and there's services you can pay for that will basically trace or track all your data, your packets, how they get to A to Z. And it's, it's kind of mind boggling. I've never really made use of it because it just, 99% of the time, it doesn't affect me and what I do and everything's fine. So I just thought that was interesting. Something for you guys, just to know when you hear that term peering or that there are other possible issues that can cause your Zoom connection, your Skype, anything where you're communicating real time to fail. Even watching Netflix, um, you might drop your Wi-Fi connection and then all of a sudden connect to your MacBook using your hotspot on your mobile phone and now Netflix streams beautifully, and you're wondering why. So that's the, why, that's the reason why. It's called peering, and look out for that. All right, something maybe a little more interesting, hopefully, and this is the ability to use your iPad as a screen for your laptop, your MacBook or your MacBook Pro or even your Mac Mini. And there's a technology called Luna Display that does this. Now, a lot of you techie people are going, 
wait a minute, I've been using Splashtop, or I'm using that new thing from Apple called Sidecar to do the same thing. Why would I buy a gadget to do what I can already do with software? Well, the thing is about Luna Display is they actually, it is a piece of hardware. It's, it's actually kind of comical when you see this thing. This is it. <laughs> this is the Luna Display adapter. This tiny little thing plugs into the graphic output, your, your display output on your Mac. Um, they make two versions. They have the mini display, a port adapter, which all the older Macs use, including this MacBook Air. And they have the new version, which is USB-C, which all the new 2016 and newer Macs pretty much all now have. And so you have to buy the right one for your computer. But once you buy this little $50 gadget, now you can install their software on your laptop and install the software on an iPad. And the two systems shake each other's hands. And now the iPad becomes a screen for your MacBook. So I thought I would just, if, if I can do it without too much distress and frustration, I thought I would see if I could demonstrate this briefly for you guys. So I'm just gonna open up my Mac. I have the Luna Display software installed. I'm launching it. It's telling me on the screen, plug in your unit Luna Display. I already had mine plugged in, so it didn't detect it. So I'm gonna now unplug it and plug it back in. And now plugging that back in, it should initialize the driver and the software. Okay, well, nothing's happening. So let's see what happens next. Since nothing's changing on that screen. If it changes sometime during this broadcast. I'll let you know. Yeah, well, let's see, it works. It's but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna load the Luna Display app on the iPad, the other side of the chain and see if when I do this, it initiates the driver. So what's happening here is the software is creating this private network connection between your iPad and your, your Mac. And so by doing so, it has lower latency of the display, how long it takes for the video signal to get from your computer to the iPad. Then if you were using, um, for example, the old school way of doing it over software using Splash Top or something like that. So now that I've done that, I'm gonna, it says I'm in Wi-Fi home mode and I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna try reinitializing this. Of course, you know, testing things live on a show is when they don't tend to work. And this would be no exception right now. And it's not working. Great for Anywho. the podcast. It's great for the podcast for you guys to see this. Oh, it's amazing. So, Look at that. Let me, let me explain why I'm going through all these motions, right? Why the heck do you care? Why would you want to put the screen of your MacBook or your Mac mini or whatever on your iPad? What is the point of doing that? The whole idea here is like, you guys have had this issue where your MacBook is somewhere near your mic. You're in your booth or your closet and your MacBook is sitting on a shelf. And the thing's fan is whirring away. Because guess what? Now we're doing Zoom. Now we're doing video chat. We're trying to record while all this stuff's going on. And the fan is going berserk. I'm hearing it all the time because I'm doing support. And I'm hearing your fans go crazy. Trust me. Not the fans that you want to go crazy. <laughs> the fan in your computer. So this is a great workaround for that. You load the software. I haven't rebooted my Mac in several days. I'm sure that has something to do with it. But you load the software. Put your Mac away from the mic. Move your MacBook out of the closet, out of the booth. Get it out of there and load this on your, on your iPad. And now the iPad screen is the screen to your Mac. And that's pretty cool because you can see what's going on in the Mac. You can, and, but not only that, can you see it, you can control it. You can have your Twisted Wave or whatever your doll is, and you can reach up and tap record on the screen. And then when you want to read your script, four finger swipe, and switch to your script. Now this is Google Photo. But anyway, you get the idea. You can very rapidly, four finger swiping, swipingly, switch between the Luna Display screen, which is your laptop, and your script, and move back and forth very, very quickly and seamlessly. And so this is a, this is a really clever uh, workaround for this. Yeah. I think it's worth 50 bucks. Most people have an iPad. It has to be relatively recent, not super ancient. Um, I actually went and bought one on eBay just for, to test it out. This is an iPad Air first generation, the very first one that came out, maybe five, six years ago. I think I paid 150 bucks shipped for it and it runs Luna Display fine. 
That's now, here's what's funny. I started using this thing so much that I realized I like having an iPad. And it's actually a little bit slow. <laughs> so I bought another one. <laughs> it just came today. You're keeping eBay in business, my friend. Yeah, so this iPad is going to be passed on to somebody who really needs it. That's you, Fifi. I don't know if you're watching, but I know she'd like to have a better an iPad that that works. So it's going to be repurposed. But I got a new iPad, and this is the very base model iPad now. It's not the Air, the Pro, anything. It's the absolute base model. Um, I got this on Amazon for two seventy nine with Prime shipping, and um, I haven't even unwrapped it yet. But when I do, I'll be testing it out, put it through its paces. But it's funny now that I have the iPad to play with. I find I want to use it a lot more often. It's pretty, it's pretty great. I it's better than yeah. holding a phone yeah. on your on your hands while you're trying to video chat with your family and watch content while you're on the on the in bed or something. So mm. I have a new I have a new one. But anyway, Luna Display, pretty slick little device. Cool. Um, yeah. I've been using a lot of time here. But the last thing is, I just want to before we go on to hissing, using Zoom, it's a really good idea, especially if you're a Windows user. If you have to do Zoom during your voiceover recording session, run it on a separate thing, whether it's a phone or a tablet, whatever you have that's available that doesn't have a fan or whatever, run Zoom on that because that fan is going to come on on your laptop and it's going to ruin a take. Or Zoom is going to take over your audio hardware, steal the driver on the Windows side away from your DAW or your software and cause havoc. So run Zoom on its own device and use your studio Mac or PC for recording. Just use your phone. That, that should do it. Yeah. Most people have a mobile phone these days that can run zoom without issue. Trust me. It's probably going to be the way to go. Make it a lot less stressful for you and your clients. So anyway, a little PSA about using zoom. Yeah. Well, all right. That's enough for me. I, that's but Everybody's got to use zoom. I mean, you and I were using zoom seven, eight years ago and then, mm -hmm. And then suddenly yeah. it was like this amazing revelation. There's Zoom. Yeah, and we're not yeah. using Zoom because everybody's using it. We're using Zoom because we've been using it a long time and we have found it to be rock solid reliable. And yeah. even now when they've had like a some kind of tenfold increase in users over the last four months, still works great. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it's it's a great tool for us. Yeah. Of course, there was the time. It wasn't one of the reasons we went to Zoom is that Skype would cut out on us all the time and then there was the day i lost yeah. you and we were doing the show and you just brought me up on your phone <laughs> one of our that's right one of our greatest moments our favorite our outtake really... that's not an outtake that's right it's actually it, it actually happened anyway Holding Dan up. Yeah. <laughs> that was fun what to go find that one we know it's around yeah. somewhere i was that's a classic i was going through old hard drives and putting them all on this eight terabyte drive I have because I can fit everything I've ever done on a computer on this one hard drive. Amazing. And, and I came, and I came across a number of videos that, that I will point out to you one of these days. Anyway, I wanted to talk about something that I keep hearing from clients and I'm, you know, people send me audio for my specimen collection cup. And one of the things I keep hearing is the sound I, I that hear that sound. No, <laughs> sorry about that. I haven't heard. I restarted my Mac. <laughs> I have. I hear that sound every day, but uh, I, I hear this sound of a far off waterfall because I find that is the perfect description of what it actually sounds like, which is this hissing of it's what we call white and pink noise. And people are like, where's that coming from? I, I don't hear it here anywhere. I only hear it. It comes from. I don't know why I'm using this old heavy interface because I guess it's with the, you know, handy it, and it looks cool. It, and it looks cool. I try, I keep trying to get this thing to work. It's, it's dead. You know, it'll pass a signal, but it won't pass it over USB. Anyway, this is usually caused by not enough gain or well, putting in too much gain into your microphone to get a decent level because you're either too far or you've got a lousy microphone. And, you know, I, it happens mostly with USB mics because USB mics have, I, I think the issue with a lot of USB mics is that they don't really have true 48 volt phantom power for the capsules that they have. And when there's not enough 
energy directed to the capsule, uh, to the plates on there, it's not as strong, and you get this analog hissing sound. It's not real loud. It's very much in the background. But the way to really avoid it, and I talk about this all the time, you know, we, we, we like this the phrase signal-to-noise ratio, which with stereo equipment, if you remember the days of stereo equipment, uh, signal-to-noise ratio meant what the noise that the equipment itself makes versus the sound of the music that you're trying to listen to. And it should be a very, very, very low thing. With voiceover, I use this phrase to say, signal is your voice. Noise is everything that's not your voice. And this analog hissing seems to be a real problem, especially people who are using USB mics. And I have a theory about that too, about the, the USB mic being noisy. Yeah, well, I'm sure there's there's a lot of reasons. I'll let you I'll let you throw that out there in a second. But yeah, it when you're trying to get a good level, and you know, as long as you can get your peaks above minus nine up to like minus six, you'll be fine. It's when you have these little tiny ones that, you know, when you try to normalize it, you're going to get that that hissing sound. So always make sure you, you find the right distance with your mic to get the optimum level without cranking your interface like past 75, 80 percent. And some interfaces can do it. The newer ones certainly can. But some of the older ones, not quite as powerful. But we did talk about this last week on, on our, our interface shootout, which people loved. You know, it was it was great. But anyway, what was your what was your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think a lot of the USB mics out there don't have a gain control on the preamp. So it they is set what it the is. preamp at a at a preset gain. They kind of guess where should it be? Forty seven dB, thirty six six dB, whatever. And so the the preamp gain is set. And so all you're left to do is hope it's about right for for the type of voiceover you're doing. If it's too hot, all you can really do is digitally turn down the mic preamp. And when I mean that, I mean, you're going into your software, like a system preferences sound input and literally turning down a little slider, but that's actually digitally just reducing the mic level, not actually reducing the gain on the preamp in most cases. So, and then vice versa can happen. It may just not be enough gain. And so you're recording something and the levels are coming in, you know, peaking at like minus 17 or minus 20, and you're not getting enough signal. And so you have to normalize. And so that noise floor comes up. So that, that is a weakness for a lot of USB mics. So the ones that have a proper gain control, like the Apogee mic, where you can really control the level on the preamp, they tend to be a lot cleaner, uh, has been my finding. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely true. I, but still, I, it, comes down to using proper mic technique. You know, you don't want to over project. And if you talk more conversationally, you still have to drive the gain in these things, even you want know, a good mm -hmm. interface. Although the newer interfaces, the ones we were testing last week, they were all really clean, which was really great. They, I mean, they were all from, they, they ranged from like good or really good to amazing, but none of them were bad. Yes. I mean, none of them were really bad in, by any stretch of the imagination. They, would, they were all plenty clean for recording a, a condenser microphone. Right. So, right. And, you know. and we've come to the conclusion when the people say broadcast quality, they just mean it doesn't sound bad. Right. It means we can throw this into a Pro Tools mix and use this for that commercial going on the radio or TV. Right. So that's what they mean. Yeah. We just wish they'd stop using that and say professional quality <laughs> audio. Right. Anyway, we got lots of questions from you guys and we really appreciate them. So stay tuned. We'll be right back with your questions here on voiceover body shop tech talk. This is Ariana Ratner and you're listening to voiceover body shop VOBS TV. Hey, it's time to talk about voiceover essentials. Dot com. You know, Harlan has some great stuff over at VoiceOver Essentials, like the VO1A microphone. But, you know, if you want to hear your audio as you recorded it, it's best to have a great set of headphones. And Harlan offers the Harlan Hogan Signature Series Voice Optimized Headphones. These are flat response headphones, not for listening to Pink Floyd or whatever you want to listen to. These have a nice flat response that give you what you recorded. Plus, 
They're incredibly comfortable. You can wear them for a really long time while you're editing an audiobook or some long format narration. It's got leather pads, a really flexible headband, and if you happen to forget you're plugged in, this thing just pops right out and then it pops right back in so you don't blow out another cord. Go over to voiceoveressentials.com for your Harlan Hogan Signature Series Voice Optimized Headphones. VoiceOverEssentials.com. It's that time of the show where we thank our wonderful sponsors, Source Elements, the creators of Source Connect and so much other stuff. If you haven't gone to Source-Elements.com lately and looked at their products list, you probably boggle your mind. They have so many different products. They even have a new one that's specifically targeting people that are doing uh, ADR looping or working to picture from home which they just launched. It's that new. I don't even, I haven't even had a chance to try it yet. They, these guys are pumping out tools left and right, but the one you're probably being asked to use from Source Elements by and large is gonna be Source Connect still. Source Connect Standard or Source Connect Pro. Now, Source Connect Standard is the version that you guys as voice actors probably is the one you're gonna to wanna to get a hold of. And you can get a driver, uh, get the software from them by just simply going to the website, source-elements.com and getting a trial. Now, if you want, if you like following step-by-step -step instructions and you like watching a video on how to do something before you do it, I would definitely recommend you check out some resources I've put together over on my website, georgethe.tech slash SC to kind of get yourself your bearings when using Source Connect because there's a setup process involved. But once it's up and running and you've got it going, it is rock solid, reliable stuff. Um, it is just the tool that's being used by pro studios and producers all over the world, really. So get it up, get it in your studio, get it working. Just get that trial going so you know you have it and you know how to use it. And when they say, hey, do you have Source Connect? You can say yes. Anyway, this has been George the Tech for VOBS. And we'll be right back after this for some more Tech Talk content. Yeah, hi, this is Carlos Ellis Rocky, the voice of Rocco, and you're watching Voice Over Body Shop. And we're back here on Voice Over Body Shop Tech Talk, number 34. 134. Right. No, 34. Yeah, no, yeah, we're 34. 34. 34. 34, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It feels like a lot more because we've been doing these shows for so long, but we started our new number counting counting system for the tech talk right beginning of 2019 but it's like halfway through 2020 already for crying <laughs> out loud jeez where is the time going for anyway crying out loud. i know we got a lot of questions today so let's let's bang through these here we first one is from alan kane he says we appreciate we i appreciate you guys well that's why we're here uh when we are on can you give your opinion of the need to do a lan specifically for Source Connect? George, that's your department. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. So here I use a dumb analogy for needing to use a LAN with Source Connect, and that is the seatbelt analogy. You don't need to wear a seatbelt to drive a car. You can drive a car perfectly fine without one. You can drive a car for months and months without wearing a seatbelt, without a single incident. But it's that one time where you get ran into or you hit something, or that seatbelt may very well save your life. Well, that is Ethernet for a source connect. So you could be using Wi-Fi and it can be working beautifully and work fine with no issues, but someday that Wi-Fi connection is going to get stomped on by something interfering with your network. And you don't know what it's going to be. Your neighbor moves in and has some crazy high-powered router. Something is going on to cause interference in the Wi-Fi universe. And that causes Source Connect unreliability. So Ethernet eliminates that. Going hardwired eliminates that variable. And um, it's become so important that studios are even telling their, their fledgling or their talent that have home studios now that uh, want to use Source Connect, they're actually mandating it. You need to be hardwired before we have this booking happen. So that's, that's what that's about. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. I love hearing from people saying, but my router's on the other side of the house. Well, <laughs> you get two options. You either run a super long Ethernet cable, which you can do. <coughs> which you can do. Or, well, there's three options. That's one. Two, power line Ethernet adapters. Google it. Trust me. Or three, 
call your phone company and say, I need another router in my office. Um, or your cable company, I think, can do that. Yeah, your cable company. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So there's a couple options to work around that problem. Good to know. Good to know. Uh, Dominic Carlos asks, for the Steinberg UR12's loopback feature, it captures audio from Skype, Zoom, etc. So you can have an independent wave or MP3 file of the call. I'm curious what more the loopback feature does. Well, the loopback feature is, it, it's really cool for a number of reasons. If you're doing remote sessions, one of the things you can do is you can, as, as you said, you can take a file you've recorded and play it back to the client directly over, you know, over your connection, over Zoom or, or whatever. Uh, it, it really is designed to, I, I think they came up with this mostly for streaming radio stations or something like that. And that's, you know, that's one use is, you know, you can play music. You know, I've, I always like to play girl from Ipanema coming through for some reason. And if, when things go quiet, it's like, da, 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 da. but it allows you to play audio from your computer back out into your program line. That's either going over zoom Skype or somewhere else. Yeah, it doesn't do, and what the UR12 does not do is what you're asking, Dominic. Yeah. So you're asking, does it capture the audio from Zoom or Skype to a separate file no. that you can listen to later? No, it doesn't do that. What does do that, and this is what's so confusing about loopback, is the Evo 4. So the Evo 4 actually does have a different kind of loopback. You can actually capture the audio coming back from the other end to two separate tracks. So you do have a separate audio recording of the Zoom call, but that's a different loopback for a completely different purpose. So if you want to produce podcasts, the Evo 4 is fantastic for that. Totally awesome. Yeah. But if you're a voice actor wanting to play back something you've recorded, Steinberg's loopback feature is better, is the one you want to use. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah. I found, I've been, I've been playing with my roadcaster, which will do that total separation. It'll take like f four different zoom tracks and separate them, which I'm still trying to figure out how to do. So if you've got like four guests on, on a podcast, you can, they all will be recorded on an individual track and there's software, mm -hmm. there's software you can do that with too. Mm -hmm. Uh, but great unit. You know, I, I'm, I'm actually quite pleased with it. Um, let's see here. Oh, he also asks, you mentioned the original M box that is 32 bit in the last tech talk. We did indeed, uh, which made me wonder what is the appropriate bit size to record at and what is bit rate? Lots Go. of questions, but we'll, <laughs> so, so there's different kinds of bits that we're talking about. There's, um, there's bit depth, which is what you're thinking of when you think of 16 bit versus 24 bit 30, recording audio, 30, right? Or 32 bit float. There's bit rate which is related to MP3. So like 192 kilobits per second, that's bit rate. But there's also the bit of the OS and the driver. So the actual bit depth of the operating system of 32 bits is, has been retired for quite a long time. So I, I don't know, I don't know which generation of Mac it was, Dan, was it, I don't know, Yosemite, it was quite a few versions back. It went from being a 32-bit OS to a 64-bit OS, and when that happened, if they, if the company that makes that that hardware decides not to have a, a driver update, then that hardware becomes obsolete, and uh, that might be one of those pieces. I'm not sure, but this old M box, which I keep right here within arm's reach because it's just fun to look at. Am I frozen? Yeah, I am frozen, aren't I? You are. We can hear you. Be Rosen. Let's just unplug my camera. Da 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 da. Nope. I didn't fix it either. And it's back. And it's back. Is it working? It is working. And it's back. Fascinating. All right, well, I'm using one of our old crazy fire cameras from the studio, so that could explain that. <laughs> it's probably overheating. <laughs> um, but the old M-Box, that's the one we're refraining to, or refraining to, referring to. 
Um, the, the hardware, firmware, everything about it is made for these older OSs. So that's what they're referring to when they mean 32-bit versus 64-bit. But what I'm not going to answer your question. What should you record at? Forever, I used to say 16-bit bit depth was completely fine. That's the bit depth that CDs are recorded at, after all. And they sound great. Um, but I've changed my tune in the last couple of years after hearing Robert from Source Elements pontificate on this subject on one of my Pro Audio Suite shows. Um, and when he said that with 24-bit, it does allow you to record at a lower peak level. And so I've been telling folks to record at 24-bit because it does allow you to have more headroom. You can give yourself a bit more peak headroom and not have to be recording from minus six to minus four peak all the time. You can actually record with a little bit more space, minus 10, minus 15. And if you normalize it, it won't be as noisy. Yeah, it won't, it won't create more noise from what's called aliasing. If you're noising, if your recording background is noisy, if you have a bad mic, you noisy background, when you normalize it, that noise is coming up, trust me. But the same file recorded to 16, 16 bit with a peak level at like minus 20, for example, and one recorded in 24 bit, the one that was recorded in 24 bit when normalized will sound cleaner. It will have less uh, hiss, theoretically. So, anyway, I say 24 bit. I say 24 bit too. I found that you, know, you, can, you can push it a little bit harder. And it's very hard to distort unless you're really screaming into the mic. Uh, so, yeah, it gives you a lot of headroom, which is really cool. So yeah, I, more, I've, more headroom. Yeah. Yeah, I've been at 24-bit for a couple of years now. I'm like, why would you do 16-bit? Almost everything supports 24-bit natively on, in the hardware side of things. Your software may still say 32-bit float. Audacity, for some weird geeky reason, defaults to 32-bit float. And most people don't even know and never even look. So that's what they're recording at, even if their hardware doesn't support it. Um, but yeah, it's completely a waste of hard drive space at that point. But yeah. All right. Um, you also mentioned the headphones you listen to. Uh, are there any differences between video game headphones and the cans that most voiceovers use? Just curious if there may be different features one offer over the others. Well, most of the video game headphones have a, heads, a, a mic boom right. also. Right. Definitely not needed at all for voiceover work. I don't know any mic boom headset that is voiceover production, pro production quality yet. So that would be something you don't need or differentiates them. Otherwise, the game headphones tend to have crazier designs with colorful plastic and lights and other things to make them look cool when you're doing your so, Yeah, so if you're into screen. that, yeah. But at the end of the day... If it's a headphone that's comfortable and they sound good to you and you can wear them for the length of a session, they're going to work fine. So I wouldn't really worry whether it's a pro or a game headphone. It's something that you're familiar with that's comfortable, that sounds good to you. I think that's probably what matters the most. So, All right. There you go. Uh, Riley Wilson asks, thanks for the show. You're welcome. Um, I am again using an older Epigee Duet Firewire with a Thunderbolt adapter into my late 2013 iMac, and it seems to work well with my ba blue baby bottle mic. Okay. Good. <laughs> Thank you. Good night, everybody. Consider yourself lucky. <laughs> okay. I had a recent Focusrite Scarlet 2 i4 that created lots of pops and clicks that I seem to have less with the Duet. How do the onboard converters with this older unit compare with some of the newer units? Well, newer. <laughs> listen to our last tech talk. Yeah, really. It's we compare hundred dollar new units, uh, hundred dollar old units, three hundred dollar old things, seven hundred dollar new things. You're going to hear how little it actually matters. It really doesn't matter hardly at all yeah. for voiceover, right? Yeah. Because we're not working at the edges of the sound spectrum, the very highest frequencies, the very lowest, the very widest dynamic range. We're not pushing the converters of our hardware to any real limits here. Right. So it, whatever works and is stable and reliable to you is fine. If somebody came to me with those two setups and asked me which one to use, I would immediately say the 2i4. But in your case, you found that to be not a reliable solution and you're using the Duet. Yeah. 
use what sounds good. We'll use what's reliable. Right. Because it's not going to make a big difference at the end of the day. Yeah. We've been hearing that a lot lately. It clicks and pops and stuff like that from some of the focus, mm-hmm. right? That I've never experienced it. Generally, I, I think it's probably more because it's a 2013 Mac with probably not a Maybe. solid, without a solid state drive or something. It might be cut. Probably not. Like you know, yeah. But probably not on that one. Yeah. But it, of course, he's saying he's, he's using an adapter from, <laughs> from Firewire to Thunderbolt. Yeah, it's it's new enough to not have a firewire port. Right. <coughs> so it needs Bless to have you. an adapter. Thank you. And Thunderbolt is firewire backward compatible and all that stuff. Um, but um, yeah, for whatever reason, for his setup, that's the most reliable. I found that firewire just got so unreliable for my client base and people I work with that it just became just too buggy. And I had the exact reverse problem from what he was having with a lot of people. So I kind of abandoned firewire for a lot of people. And it's a shame because there was some really good equipment out there that used firewire. Right. Uh, Michael K. Now this is a similar question. Just a little twist different at the end here. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. I have a duet two into my iMac. The preamps and the converters are said to be the best pristine sound. What's what Apogee is known for? That's yeah. right. They're great at it. I also have a Focusrite solo. I'm losing clarity and vocal quality when I use the phone. Fo- or am I use- losing fo- uh, clarity and vocal quality when I use the Focusrite? Probably not. We did not hear any significant difference that would, some engineer would say, no, we'll hire this guy because he's got this interface. And no. Yeah, it, it doesn't happen, guys. Go back and listen to our last show. I mean, we you can jump between, we don't have the Duet 2 in that, particular test but we have its cousin the less less expensive uh the one you want yeah very closely related and you can go between the focus right scarlet solo Jen. i think it's a gen Gen, why i keep saying gen Gen 2 or gen 1 maybe it was even the gen 1 might have been yeah it was the old one and you can go between them and hear how how darn similar they really are they're incredibly similar um ain't gonna ain't gonna make your your bookings change in any way but uh now the Behringer twelve hundred four. I'm assuming you mean the USB one. Yes, that's likely going to be a little bit less clean. Yeah, simply because there's a lot more crud in the signal, faders and pots and buttons and multiple channels, and a mix bus and all that stuff. And it's not so, designed for voiceover. It's designed yeah. for a live band and a PA system. Not really for recording. I mean, they they put the USB port in a mixer like that because it's kind of a nice accessory. Right, you can record your set. Get a copy of the set, yeah. And that's exactly. I I think that's why they did that. Now, can you use it for voiceover? Eh. You can it, use it for podcasting. It's probably really it's good for It's great podcasting. for podcasting. I've used them for podcasting. I've actually yeah. used a, a, a Behringer 1204. Yeah. And uh, it works, but it's a little noisier than, say, you know, some of the higher-end uh, uh, interfaces we've used. Yeah, it's noisier than, I would say, the Scarlet Solo, arguably. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, take Bright and C. Okay, Bryden C. I was browsing the internet today, and I saw Uh-oh. someone say that. Uh, what happened? Oh, you're just reacting to I'm like. Oh, it's a, it was you're reading, reading ahead. I was like, I was on the internet. Uh oh. Oh, I was on the internet. Oh, yeah, exactly. Um, and I saw someone. Someone I always loved this. Someone uh, say that beveled foam squares and are useless for sound treatment, and they are just for looks. He stated that you should only use fiberglass insulation that is four inches thick. What are your thoughts? Thanks. Feel free to use us on the show. And we are. Um, Okay. So if you're going to compare four inch thick fiberglass, if you're talking about compressed fiberglass, like the Owens Corning OC703 stuff. Yeah. I mean, that's comparing apples to oranges, honestly. Um, Two inch thick acoustical foam. Is okay, not very effective, especially for what it costs sometimes. And if you buy the really cheap stuff, it's practically acoustically useless. <laughs> I mean, the sound goes right through it as though it's not even there. Um, so yes, the four inch thick insulation is going to be better. But do you need four inch thick acoustic uh, fiberglass in your booth? Probably not. That's probably overkill to wallpaper a booth with that stuff. Yeah, unless you're but make a base. Yeah, I mean, unless you're you're always doing like ninja voices for games or something like that. <laughs> yeah, if you're yelling, screaming in your booth, you might need that extra 
control. Um, if you're going to make a base trap, the four inch thick fiberglass is definitely going to be far, far better. And so at least maybe in a small booth, having one wall or one panel made with that four inch thick stuff is going to be beneficial, but you don't need that for everything. Um, so yeah, so the foam squares helpful to a degree, but mostly it's design. Mostly it looks interesting. Mostly it's just easy to glue up, but it doesn't really acoustically work all that great. It's not that good. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see here. Jeff Holman asks. Hi, hey, Jeff. I know we, we know Jeff. Our chat uh, room mod. Yeah. I'm having a problem doing pickups on my audio book. I recorded with the gain too low, then normalized in my editing. When I try to insert a pickup now with the gain at a normal level, the inserted recordings sound different from the original. That's right. Uh, more tinny, like a tin can, less bassy, less full. What might cause that? Uh, that's that's when you go back and you re-record. Uh, yeah, I find that a lot of people are like they're sending me files and their levels. They don't understand getting their levels straight and and monitoring that before they start recording. It's like, oh, I'll just go turn my microphone. But check those things. You know, photographers take a, a, a here, I just happen to have one handy. You know, they, they check the focal length on the camera to the object and stuff like that. Double check your, your input levels, record something quickly and say, okay, that's good. And don't like, like, okay, I'm going to record an entire chapter for 45 minutes and then find, oh, the level's too low. You're, when you, ch you, ch you would change the dynamic range, it's going to make changes. What do you think? Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess when he says less bassy, I, I don't know what, lo levels never affect bass. Right. What affects bass is proximity. So I'm guessing based on that, that your mic proximity or your placement is not dead on consistent. That's possible. So just like Dan said, camera operators check focus. They set their focal length literally on the distance to the lens from the actor. You might need to do the same thing and use a, a ruler or some object that you can use as a, maybe you always use the same pen hmm. and use that as a gauge, but always be the same distance from the microphone. Because I really feel based on what, again, what you're describing here. That it's it's that is the the true issue here. Yeah. Eight um, inches is exactly this, so I now know that stretched yeah, out that's eight people. inches, yeah. which is hurting the tendonitis in my overmoused finger. Anyway, <laughs> it might be seven inches in a couple of years. Is you can't do that as far anymore. Yeah, All right, get um, it out there. Yeah. yeah. So I would say I would ch I would be really careful about your proximity, your mic placement, where you're working the mic when you do those pickups. If it's not dead on consistent, it's not going to, that's going to cause you more trouble than anything else. No question. Sure. No question. Yeah. All right. I don't quite get this last one about the peering issue and net neutrality. Oh, what does this peering issue have to do with net neutrality? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, nothing, which is why we didn't mention net neutrality. <laughs> net neutrality is like, you know, big companies paying other big companies for preferential treatment. Right. That's the net or net neutrality or the lack of net neutrality. Right. Um, but uh, as, as in terms of what does that actually relate, how the two relate to each other. It's a bit of a stretch. That's probably a, a Google search answer that I would. I mean, I'm literally Googling it right now to see if I can of find course something you're really Googling helpful. It right now. <laughs> net neutrality, how service providers peering changes could impact your business. Right. It, it's There's them. stuff out there to read, but I, it's definitely not something I'm, I'm knowledgeable about. Right. So, all right, but we know everything else and uh, we appreciate all your questions here on voiceover body shop tech talk. That's going to do it for us for another week, but uh, we still got a little bit to cover in just a second. So don't go away. We'll be right back. This is Bill Ratner and you're enjoying voiceover body shop with Dan Leonard and George Whittem. VOBS.TV. You know you want to narrate audiobooks. You know that the ACX Masterclass is the best way to learn how to be profitable and successful at narrating audiobooks. But you may not know that this is registration week for the ACX Masterclass. 
David H. Lawrence the 17th and Dan O'Day only hold the ACX Masterclass once or twice a year. And this is Registration Week. And here's one more thing you might not know. If you register before Tuesday night, June 2nd at 9 p.m., they'll pay the first $300 of your tuition fee. Instead of it being $1,995, it's just $1,695. But you have to act fast. Visit acxmasterclass.com, that's acxmasterclass.com, for the very best audiobook narration and production training. Just $16.95 if you act before Tuesday at 9 p.m. Pacific. Go to acxmasterclass.com. Your dynamic voiceover career requires extra resources to keep moving ahead. Now there's one place where you can explore everything the voiceover industry has to offer. That place is voiceoverextra.com. Whether you're just exploring a voiceover career or a seasoned veteran ready to reach that next professional level, stay in touch with market trends, coaching, products and services while avoiding scams and other pitfalls. Voiceover Extra has hundreds of articles, free resources and training that will save you time and help you succeed. Learn from the most respected talents, coaches, and industry insiders when you join the online sessions bringing you the most current information on topics like audiobooks, auditioning, casting, home studio setup and equipment, marketing, performance techniques, and much more. It's time to hit your one-stop daily resource for voiceover success. Sign up for a free subscription to newsletters and reports and get 14 bonus reports on how to ace the voiceover audition. It's all here at voiceoverextra.com. That's voiceoverxtra.com. As a voice talent, you have to have a website. But what a hassle getting someone to do it for you. And when they finally do, they break or don't look right on mobile devices. They're not built for marketing and SEO. They're expensive. You have limited or no control. And it takes forever to get one built and go live. So what's the best way to get you online in no time? Go to voiceactorwebsites.com. Like our name implies, voiceactorwebsites.com just does websites for voice actors. We believe in creating fast, mobile-friendly, responsive, highly functional designs that are easy to read and easy to use. You have full control. No need to hire someone every time you want to make a change. And our upfront pricing means you know exactly what your costs are ahead of time. You can get your voiceover website going for as little as $700. So if you want your voice actor website without the hassle of complexity and dealing with too many options, go to voiceactorwebsites.com where your VO website shouldn't be a pain in the you-know-what. You're watching VOBS.TV. I don't know why. It's crazy what they do here. I think I'm going to go somewhere else and have a cheese sandwich. All right, and we are back here on VoiceOver Body Shop for, a, another, for another minute or two anyway. Uh, who are the donors that we have the last couple of weeks? We definitely have those in spades. Uh, Dwayne DeSalvo, Brian Roush, Antland Productions, Michelle Blinker, Christopher Epperson, Philip Sapir, Trey Speaks for You, Trey Mosley, Dominic Carlos, Voice Presentations Limited, ooh, a corporation, ooh. Mr. George Whittem, my dad, thanks, dad, Patty Gibbons, Stephanie Sutherland, Mike Gordon, Shauna Pennington Baird, Martha Kahn, hi, Martha, Don Griffith, and Lee Penny, aka yeah. 949 Design. Thank you, Lee Penny. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, we're, 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 we're on our new set while we're doing this all virtually because it just looks so damn cool. Uh, <laughs> it's fun. Yeah, but we'll we'll be getting back to looking at your booths pretty soon. So send those to us now. Uh, you know, take a picture of your booth in landscape, not in portrait. Uh, and uh, we will, uh, we'll, George and I will sit in there when we, George and I can finally get together. And Hold do your this. phone this way. <laughs> yeah, that'll, that'll be a big help. Uh, so send those to the guys at V-O-B-S dot TV. And maybe we'll do something with it. Uh, we need to thank our amazing sponsors who have been very supportive of us during these incredibly weird times. Uh, yeah. Like Harlan Hogan's voiceover essentials. Voiceover extra. Source elements. VOHeroes.com. Voiceactorwebsites.com. 
and JMC Demos. All right. Also, the Dan and Marcy Leonard Foundation for live and recorded web and podcasting. Uh, Jeff Holman on on chat room duty. Sue Merlino just kicking butt, doing it remotely from her home in Burbank. How we've done this is beyond our own imagination. Who knew that we would have to do it this way? Although we did have a little practice, I guess. But she's doing a great job. And Lee Penny for being Lee Penny. Thanks, Lee. Uh, that's going to do it for us this week. You know, we're here to answer your questions. George and I are here to help you professionally with your home studios. And uh, so get a hold of us. You know how to do it. And uh, But the bottom line really is, if it sounds good, it is good. That's going to do it for us this week, guys. We'll see you next week here on Voice Over Body Shop. Have a great night. Take care, everybody. Stay safe. Wash your hands. Don't touch your face.